the topic for today is uh, the thought process of management decision making. And I want to break that down a little bit more into you know, two parts. First is the thought process, meaning uh, how you think and what really goes inside, what goes through the mind of somebody who makes decisions and management decisions. Um, it could be someone in a middle management position. It could be someone who is top management. It could even be someone just, you know, making decisions for inventory or anything like that. So first, who am I? I know it's a, it's a tough question if you ask yourself that, but if you ask me that, uh, my answer will most probably be this. My name is Jackson Wan, and I'm a managing director of uh, two companies, and I also fix companies for a side job. So it's my job to consult with people on how they can make their companies a lot better. So when you think about the thought process of management decision making, a lot of things probably come into mind, like what, what's management, what's decision making, what's, what's a thought process, what's, what's any of these and what's all of these. Um, but let me ask you a question of how do you usually make decisions? Like, for example, in the morning, uh, what do you do? right after you wake up do you do you have some sort of morning ritual do you just straight jump into a meeting because you wake up at like 11 a.m do you uh have breakfast first do you maybe do some prayers or maybe do some exercise before anything uh how do how do you do those decisions i mean it might be second nature to you now but it's it's good to it's good to think about these little things and uh what i can say about that is decisions have lots and lots and lots of moving parts like for example if you took the example of brushing your teeth in the morning uh what toothpaste do you buy and when do you buy toothpaste what brand do you buy why do you buy that brand what brand of toothbrush do you use? What brand of other things do you buy? Do you, do you, would you like to do it in a mirror? Do you do it while showering? Do you listen to music while you're brushing your teeth? Or do you think about the day ahead? Everybody has their own different way of brushing their teeth. And I mean, maybe the central act, the, you know, just, just brushing your teeth is the same, but what, what happens in the background is a lot different. And uh, maybe it's five minutes for some people, maybe it's two minutes for some people, but you can really see how different someone can take a normal everyday activity and turn it into something that could help them aid the rest of their day. And so let's take this for example, commuting to work. Um, when you commute to work, at least maybe before all this happened, um, there are lots of moving parts. So you need to know if the train is working today, especially in our country. Uh, you need to know if you have the money to go or maybe the beep card or uh, other things that you use. Do you have your bag for the office? Do you have everything else? And once you're set for that, you can commute. But you seem to do these things almost naturally. Like it, you don't need, you don't have to sit down and think, uh, do I have the money to do this? Do I have uh, should I should I take the train? Should I take the bus? Should I take the? It seems almost like it's normal. And this is a very important question into digging deeper 
into your decisions. Why? Now, before you think this is a Simon Sinek ripoff, or a, uh, it's, it's, I think, more of a philosophy question. Why? Why do things happen? Why are things placed here? Why is everything the way it is? Why, why, why? And then you keep asking why until you hit a wall, until you hit a dead end. And maybe you, maybe you back up and go another way, or maybe that end really is the end. So when you make decisions, um, it's always good to ask this. Or when you analyze the moving parts of a decision, it's always good to ask. Why? Understanding what things are and why they are there can make for powerful decision making. And that's why we ask why. Uh, for example, if you're a manager and uh, you get to work and you sort of ask yourself, instead of just um, executing something you got from the higher-ups, you sort of ask, why this team is like this? Why, is, why does my team consist of maybe five people? Why, why five people? Why not six? Why not three? Why not? Why a different number? Um, what do those people really do? I mean... I guess one could be manager of this, one could be the, the, the one who executes uh, paperwork for this, accounting, et cetera, et cetera. But knowing exactly what they do and what they're not supposed to do and sort of bringing that into your decision-making really does make for powerful decision-making. And that is how you get through problems when you, well, I mean, decisions are mostly made when there are problems uh, or even sometimes good problems. Like we have too much money, we don't know what to do with it. I, I think that sounds like a good problem or we don't have enough money. What are we going to do about it? So a problem statement usually is like this. You have your current state, you have the gap. So you mean like a hole, a wall, or whatever, and then the future state. And when you make a problem statement, you have your current state of maybe your team or just yourself, and then there's a gap or a wall, meaning there's something blocking you or keeping you from reaching that future state. But you can perfectly see what this wall is. I mean, if this wall is just a, a makeshift cement wall that uh, people made in a day, or is it the Great Wall of China? Is it the Berlin Wall? Is it is it a whole, is it the Grand Canyon? Is it whatever? And then the future state is what you want to be in the future. What goal do you want to achieve? What what change has to happen? What is this end that you're reaching? And usually, this is how we describe things. Um, when we make a problem statement, we start with I am. So you describe with three to four key characteristics. Who are they? If you're making a problem statement for a client, for example, um, you make the I am about them, not about you, because it's their problem, not yours. Uh, and you're trying to help solve them. Uh, what's next is what I want to do. So you list down desired outcomes, but limit it to essential outcomes. What are they trying to achieve? So, for example, uh, you've now worked with a client. What do these clients want to do? What do they want to be? But, and this is the gap. This is what we call the gap or the wall. The but. 
Okay, not that kind of. Uh, describe what problems or barriers stand in their way. What bothers them most? So now you've talked to the client, you've talked to them about everything, and may they may or may not say it outright. Like, for example, if you're a gym instructor and you're asking somebody what they want to be, of course, I mean, sometimes maybe people just want to lose weight, but sometimes people want to be muscular or, or gigantic. But uh, they will probably not, well, m more than most of the time, they won't say what their real habits are. So you have to discover that by yourself or through talking to them, but in a non-intrusive way. Uh, that also happens in the corporate world and in the business world when, you know, when clients say, hey, we need you to solve this. It's usually when they say that it's this or this problem. It usually goes a lot deeper than that. They're not saying everything. And uh, that's also the reason why some people are trapped in certain gigs or certain clients who who say one thing and then they end up solving this gigantic problem. But at the start, they said, oh, it's just a small problem. So it's important to put this in the problem statement early on so you can talk about how much time you need and how much resources you need from both ends. Because what needs to be solved? So now you have the problem, you need to address the root cause. And the root cause is usually different from the problem, sometimes very far actually. Like for example, if a person has, or a company has a financial problem, like it seems like they're selling enough items or enough services and they're reeling in the money, but at the end of the day, their accounting seems to show a negative. But, I mean, you know, they're, they're, they're selling millions and millions. But for some reason, they don't seem like they're spending enough. Uh, I mean, they're spending more than that. So they don't understand why they're negative. And sometimes... Uh, it could be theft. Sometimes it could be an accounting problem that, that they might have the money. It's, it's just that they record it poorly. Or sometimes it's just really that they didn't know that what they spent. So you need to get to the root of everything. And that's usually taken... I mean, it takes a while. It takes a while. And uh, lastly, and I feel. Describe the emotions from the client's point of view and how does it impact them emotionally? Does it frustrate them? Does it excite them? As much as we want business to be clear-cut, cold, logical, mathematical, we really cannot separate emotions from anything. And that just makes a, for a dull world. And of course, I mean, you have to know what their immediate response is. If an accounting problem makes them angry, you need to know that they'll get angry and they'll get angry throughout the whole process of solving things. If, a, a man, if your manager gets excited every time you have a problem, you need to know that this excites them or, and sometimes maybe the excitement can get in the way. And we include this because these are somehow sometimes uncontrollable. These are part of the people's general character. And these are people you work with. These aren't, these aren't computers that uh, just do or not do or yes or no, these feelings can affect the trajectory of your project and 
you need to take them into account.